Hello and welcome along to what will hopefully be the first of many five-year reviews from this FM21 Builder Nation story with Bangor City with me, Daniel. We're back today at the five-year point just to put our first bookmark in the series. Those of you that have followed this channel for a long time will know this is something we like to do, particularly with sort of a Builder Nation or a One Club story, just to get a sort of gauge as to how the footballing world's changing, how we're progressing in our long-term objectives, and how the rest of our country is, particularly in a save like this. So if you're looking forward to that, a little stopgap in the series, please do put a thumbs up on the video. As I say, hopefully the first of many, as that would suggest we're doing our job well still in 5 or 10 or 15 years down the line. We normally get to around 20 seasons in his one club save, so hopefully we'll be able to do that successfully again. We've got a long way to go in Europe, but of course we had our first run last season, so if you've missed any of the series so far, you can catch up with that in the eye above. There's links to all the other playlists, including the journeyman story, the head coach, and of course there's a link to the podcast channel with loads of football content too. If you want to stay up to date and make sure you don't miss any of the next five years, subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on. As we take a look back at our first five years of Bangor City, and it's been a bit of an interesting one. Not so much on the pitch, ironically. I know the last season things have really taken shape. I know we had a disaster about halfway through this five years, where we bottled the title and threw everything away in the third. But otherwise, on the pitch it's not been too bad. It's not been too eventful. One of the things that has been is the off-the-pitch situation, the ownership situation, which has been going in circles. Some of the bizarre things with the club culture... And perhaps more importantly, some of the bizarre things going on with other clubs in the nation. So that's something we're going to be looking at very keenly over the course of this episode, as it seems to have shaped most of the storyline. It's been an incredibly successful save on the pitch now, particularly the last two years, and I'm really starting to feel like we've got domestic dominance in us. But in terms of Europe, to compete at that top level, we need a few more things to go our way. Hopefully, today is the sign that one or two of those may well come true in the next few weeks. But of course, one of the other things we want to do today is just have a little glance at how the footballing world's going on. We'll do the same in the head coach at the five years there. We love to get the comparison between the two stories, just to see how the footballing world is changing in both. But for now, let's start with the Welsh Pyramid. Firstly, for any of you who have missed any of the series, you're going to get loads of spoilers in the next few minutes. But let's start with the Welsh Premier League, because if we look at past winners, it's been a very strange situation for us. The first season, of course, we were in the second tier. We came up at the first attempt, off the pitch issues and player sales blighted us, but we'll come back to that in a moment. What was unique is that when we came up to the top tier, we won the title pretty convincingly first year, and that's largely to do with TNS, who we'll talk about in a moment. But the third year was where it all went wrong on the pitch. We were top at the halfway point, we just clawed our way back after a poor start, after our first introduction to Europe in the save. And then it all went pear-shaped. So many players out of form. It led to one of the biggest overhauls on the pitch that we've seen in the series. And thankfully, that's led to far greater success. Two back-to-back -back invincible seasons. Fantastic runs against different sides. And the last season led to a memorable European run as we made it all the way to the quarterfinals at the Europa Conference. We won a few domestic titles as well. We got the Welsh Cup the last two years, the League Cup three times as well. And we finished off season five with our first domestic treble, something we can really be proud of. In terms of on the pitch at the club, everything's looking great. But the focus of these episodes isn't really the club on the pitch. Of course, one of the things we have tried to do is keep familiarity. So despite all of the nonsense off it, the change in players, the change in guard, the only thing we haven't changed is this. The tactic, the blueprint for football, remains identical to the first game we played here. We started with a diamond, we continue with a diamond. We've seen different players come and go throughout. We had a lot of problems in the first season with players being sold under our nose, players being let go, players who we couldn't get new deals for, and a wacky chairman who was doing some dodgy deals on the side. But otherwise, this bit has never changed. It's remained the constant. If we look at the transfers though, it's one of the things I want to allude to in the first few years. Because of course the unique part of this save, or the unique element, is the fact that we started with a largely Italian and Argentinian side. It was a very weird mix because of the ownership issues. We had those club culture items to sign players based in Italy and players based in Argentina. Something that with Brexit, with work permit issues, has caused huge problems. But it looks like we might be seeing the end of those now. Of course, I do want to reflect on some of the stars we had at the start of the save. Names we've probably forgot about, given our recent successes. So the likes of Ted Malden, 
who don't forget was the first man sold under our nose. He came in on a free and was sold for about 20 grand. He's made a good career for himself. People like Samuel Fanian, who scored 78 goals in 90 league appearances, now playing in the EFL, about to get released. The likes of James Boot, who's been a solid player, is now at Notts County playing in the EFL. And to be fair, there's still some of the constants. The first season saw us sign Greg as a Brett, joined in December in the second tier, and four and a half years later, he's our first choice in the quarterfinals of the Europa Conference. There are some huge positives in that. Jack Bolton has been our left back ever present throughout the series. Give or take half a season of Jimmy Jarrett this year, he's always been the first choice. And that's some of the, the foundations we've tried to build as we've gone along. There was a huge overhaul. There were loads of loan deals. There were loads of players going in and out the club. But when we got to season two, or even January of this season, the first one, that's when we started to encounter our problems. Because we got to the stage where we'd signed so many players that didn't meet that Italian and Argentinian criteria that our chairman started to block deals. And from that point, all the way up to when the new chairman came in place at the start of this season, we've not been able to instigate deals for anyone who's already at a club. So we've been able to go for players in the free agent market. That's not been an issue. But of course, one of the things we have had to rely on is our director of football to get good loan deals, to get players in on transfers from other clubs, which hasn't really happened, to be brutally honest. But some of those loan stars have then become permanents. If you look through the years, in season two, Liam Coyle, who's just about to leave the club again. In season three, Jack Bolton, who was on loan the first year, joined permanently. Paul Glatzel and Ethan Vaughan we had on loan that season. They're now permanent members of the squad. In season four, we had Badebo, we had Cottrell. They became stars in season five. Ian Brooks is still at the club. We hope he'll be one of the next ones. And Jimmy Jarrett, what we would do to get him back. But that's the foundation we've tried to build on. It's been something very important to us. But one of the issues we've had with that is even last season, when we got the new chairman in, we didn't lose that club culture item to sign players based in Argentina. However, this summer, looking ahead to season six, you can see here, it has finally gone. Now, my hope is that moving forward, this will allow us to really splash the cash, to really go and sign players we want to. And just give us a little bit of freedom back to build this club. Because until we build the club and get consistent European results, we're never going to build that nation behind us. So that's something that has to be an aim for us. It's something very important to me. You can see we're starting to build facilities as well. Because off the pitch is the main thing here. If we improve those things, if we're self-sustainable, if we bring for our own players, that's when we can start to increase some of the other stuff. If we can start to increase the reputation of the league and the club, get the players worth more money, get them sold for more money, that's where this save really starts to build. So at a club level, we're finally starting to see the fruits of our labour. And to be honest, after five years and a lot of frustrations, it's coming just at the right time. We've got extremely high expectations in Europe, something that's happened last year as well. And on that occasion, we couldn't meet it at Champions League level. But this year, I'm pretty sure we can. What I do want to look at more broadly, though, is the nation. Now, that's not just this league table, where we've got some very bizarre tales over the past five years. But that's also coefficients, that's also finances, that's also reputation. Because that's something that's going to be key to this save. And when we looked at the start, the thing we earmarked the most, and the club that we felt would be the most important, is TNS. Because they're the only other professional side in this league pyramid. Of course, they did their job, they won the first season, they won the title, absolutely brilliant. But then look what happened after that. 21-22, they finished third when we won the title. The following season, they finished fifth, then they finished third, and it's only last season that they've came back and been best of the rest. And even then, they nearly blew it. So it's one of the things we've been most disappointed by in this series, is the fact that TNS haven't competed with us, haven't dragged along with us. And without that performance in Europe, without them playing in the higher competitions or getting the better draws, they're not going to improve with us. And if we're having to do it alone, it's going to take a lot longer. They did get through one qualifying round this year, which was important. And hopefully they'll do the same again. But if we have a look at the transfer history for them, they're not really investing in huge numbers of players outside the nation. Now, they're bringing in a few loan deals. So you've seen this season, they've brought four players in on loan from English sides. But otherwise, the vast majority of their signings have been those coming in from other Welsh clubs. And that doesn't help us either, because Carmarthen finished second last year, and then their best player, or one of, has gone to TNS on a free. And that can't continue to happen, because TNS are the professional club. They're the ones with the finances, with the scouting range, 
with that professional law that can get players in from other countries, they've got to take advantage of that and not keep playing in their own house. Because as long as they keep signing from the Welsh League, we're going to keep plateauing across the nation. So that's something else I'm looking out for as well. Barrytown United were brilliant that third season, won the league at a canter. Since then, it's harmed them. The second season, they finished fifth. Then they finished seventh. It's very strange. I don't know why it says the competition didn't complete every time. But in the bottom half this year, it really is a fall from grace. And they're going to need a big summer window. But the problem with them and Carmarthen, who were brilliant in the European qualifiers this year, they got to the third qualifying round, is they keep losing their best players. They keep signing from other Welsh clubs because they're semi-pro. They've not got that lure outside the country. And that's something that really worries me moving forward because those sides can't keep picking the best of each other or we're going to have this continued rotation. We need one or two of them to get in Europe three or four years straight, get through a few qualifying rounds, build up the finances and go pro. That's the only way this changes. What could potentially help that is if they start in latter qualifying rounds in these competitions. And the competition reputation is starting to aid that. So this season, we've gone up to 94th place. Previously 103rd, down here with the likes of the Hungarian third tier, the Kosovan League. But now we're starting to get above those. We're just starting to build our way up. And what we're really looking at over the next couple of seasons is getting this two-star reputation. Getting up there with the likes of Serie C, with the Northern Irish League, which is probably a local competition. With League 2 in the EFL, if we can get to that level, so players from League 2 getting released can say, let me go and have a look at the Welsh clubs. That will make such a difference to this save. It's something that's got to be a consideration later down the line. And it opens up a lot more possibilities. The same as the Irish Premier Division there. They're all two-star reputation leagues. And that's really what we've got to be aiming for moving forward. So I'm hoping with our reputation increasing in Europe, the way we've been doing, that will change things moving forward. If we go and have a look at the coefficient, that's something that's very important to this as well. At club level, the five-year seedings look fantastic for us. We've had a massive jump this year from the 450s up to around 105. We got 15 coefficient points last season. And if we can get into the group stages again, that run's going to continue. Carmarthen came up 100 places. TNS came up 50 places. They're starting to be progress on that front. And once we get three or four sides up in the top 250, up in the top 300, then they'll start to get a bit higher in those first qualifiers. So that's something we've got to look for as well. And although these are the five years used for seedings, if we look at the 10 years used for revenue, that's something that's going to come a little bit later down the line. Because of course, we've got those five dud years before we joined, before we started building this nation, where none of the Welsh success is really going to be about. If we put them in nation order and go down to Wales, you can see there we're down in 176th. And in fact, actually, TNS aren't that far behind us because they've been the predominant side in Europe. But they need to have continued success for that to work. Of course, you've got that standout in a second season. When we were playing in the top tier for the first time, they got all the way to the playoff. And that's the difference that the second qualifying round there, which is 1.5 points, the third qualifying round with Carmarthen there, which is two, and in the playoff round, a round later, four and a half for TNS. So they're those little differences that have got to come along. But their squads aren't going quick enough. And until that happens again, we're still going to be held back to an extent. And you've got all of these switch arounds with Barry some years, Connors Key some years, Carmarthen the last couple. They just keep taking it in turns. It needs to be consistent to build three or four clubs. And that's something that's not quite happening yet. So hopefully with the way Bangor City are going, that big run last year, we'll be able to take advantage again next season. And then we can help build the rest of the nation too. Because we've got to do it consistently. If we fail to make the group stages this year after what happened last season, we really are in trouble again. And of course, the final thing that that affects in terms of coefficient is where we sit here. And that is qualification places. You see, until we get up to 30th and then 29th a bit further down the line, we're still going to have all of those other three sides in the first qualifying round for the Europa Conference. If we can get to that stage where one or two of them are automatically in the second qualifiers, that could be all the difference we need. It could really give us a little bit of a boost, help clubs get a little bit further. If they can get themselves seeded for that, then do they get to the third qualifier? Then do they get to the playoffs? Then one lucky draw, they're in the group stages. That's got to be the aim too. The club coefficients per nation, we're in 38th at the moment as we mentioned, but we had that big season last year of 6.625. 
Now that first season that's going to come off next year, where the series started, was an awful year. We were in the second tier. TNS weren't a great side at the time, and there wasn't much else in terms of competition. But although we complain about the rate of the nation is building, the squads are very slightly getting better now. And that means this 0.625 should change to that 1.625. And a couple more years of that, and we could creep into the top 30. It's only four points ahead at the end of the day. And with Wales next season, if we get to the group stages, we could be the difference between that and 30th. And we know as a club, in the immediate future, this is our duty. Get those other clubs into the second qualifying round. Give them the finances where they can turn professional and then let them build the nation as well. So this is where our responsibility comes in. Can we get ourselves through to those group stages? And it's the same for any of you guys trying to build a nation. You've got to get those points on the board yourself before you can get the other clubs into the later qualifying rounds. Once you do that, you've got the opportunity because they can then build themselves. One lucky draw, they're in the group stages. That's when the nation starts to build. So you have that sort of dilemma where it's a little bit too one-sided domestically, but you have to focus on Europe and keep building. Because if you don't, you're going to end up plateauing the whole nation, despite giving them more of a chance domestically. It's a very weird turn of events. And of course, the final part that's important of this build a nation, we talked about getting offered the Wales job a year or so ago, but this is the important bit. Wales, in terms of the international rankings, have managed to stay 35th, which is a pretty good outlay for them. And if they continue to stay up in that top 50 and compete amongst these other European sides, if we can get one, of our, one or two of our players into their international team, that's when we really start to notice it as well. So that's something we've got to focus on probably a bit later down the line. And perhaps we will end up taking on the Wales job later. It wasn't quite right the first time around. But once we get those youngsters coming through, once we build the youth academy, the youth facilities, the recruitment, this is where we can have an impact on this side. And hopefully that's when the nation does better at international level as well as domestically. So with that, we look ahead to the next five years and what are the objectives for the nation? I appreciate this episode won't be everyone's cup of tea. It's not one of those where we're excitedly commentating on games or talking about the teams. But the thing with the Builder Nations is a lot of us, and myself included till a few years ago, didn't really know what to prioritise or what was the most important. Or do you make yourself weaker in the league to help the other teams compete? Or do you go stronger, try and get better in Europe and help the others push up? It's always been a harder thing to sort of balance out. So my advice is always this, and this is what we're hoping to achieve the next five years. We are going to be responsible for this competition getting a two-star reputation. That takes us up to the likes of Northern Ireland, where we built the nation last year. We got them to two and a half. We saw the difference it made the last season. We've got to do the same here. If we can get to that level, then the Welsh sides can sign a player from Linfield, from Larne, from professional sides in Northern Ireland, and it gives them a bigger market and a bigger pool in the UK. In terms of the European coefficients, as we've mentioned, we've got to keep Wales' world ranking high. And if that means we have to take the national job when they're in crisis, that's probably a better point to do so. But in terms of the national coefficients for the European competitions, that is our biggest aim the next five years. Be consistent in Europe, make the group stages, make sure we get into that top 30. Because when we come back at the end of season 10, we want another side to have been in the group stages once. Whether that's one team in season 10, it doesn't matter. We have to be in that top 30 for it to happen because the Welsh sides aren't strong enough to get through four qualifying rounds. Not of the Europa Conference as unseeded teams. If we get them all into that second qualifier, you can get a luckier draw. And if they get to the playoffs two years in a row, then their coefficient improves. They're the seeded side. That's what we're aiming for. That's the big idea. We've got to try and share some of our players out with the other teams in the nation. So with players who are sort of on the fringe of the squad, it is a risk and we do have to pay out the money if it doesn't work out. But at this stage with the European football, we can afford it. Wales is very fortunate that it has a domestic loan window between mid-September and late October, possibly even a bit later actually. So what we want to do is save a few of our players and if any of the domestic clubs come in to loan them, even if they're our first team players, once we've reached the European group stages, doesn't matter. Loan them there. Let them improve those clubs. Let them fight at those teams. Let them have a higher reputation player who can do more. Doesn't matter if you're paying half the wages. Make sure you improve the other sides in the nation. We're going to try and do that this season. Perhaps with the likes of Kean Gwennell if we can get another keeper in. Perhaps with Kieran Clark or Ryan Hughes if other sides come in for them. Perhaps with um, some of those centre-halves coming back. The Alex Reid, the Ben Hockenhull. We've got to tempt sides like TNS to come in for them. Because they're the ones that are going to improve their team. 
and they're the other side who are going to help us improve the nation. So that's the sort of plan we've got over these five year periods. I know this one's a little bit of an in-depth strategy, probably spreadsheet style episode rather than the exciting hustle and bustle you want to see. But I felt it's really important that I explain to you the style of the Build a Nation save, exactly what we're hoping to achieve. Because at the moment, we're just getting to that stage where we're saying we're dominating domestically. I hope it's not too boring just showing the European games. And you want to see that there's a long term plan to help build the other clubs as well. I think we probably will dominate domestically for five or ten years until those other clubs build up. But that's not what we've got to focus on at the moment. It's got to be about supporting those other clubs. And for that to happen, we've got to be a success. So that's the plan for the next five years. That's our look back at the last five years. I will very quickly, just because I'll get told off if I don't, show you what the Premier League looks like. Liverpool have won it three of the five years. Manchester United the other two. Not many surprises in there, I'd say. In fact, bar Watford and Bournemouth, I think it's all the original sides. So all clubs that are currently Premier League or who were relegated the season before the save started. My beloved Luton Town are still in the Championship. I had a quick glance before. Peter Brew in there, which obviously is good to see them back. But the big surprise is definitely Walsall. A Championship club, they've done really well. They've built themselves up and they've built sustainably. So you've got to give them praise for how they're doing. In terms of League One, not so many massive shocks there. Wrexham have got themselves up two divisions. Grimsby have got themselves up a level as well. Unfortunately, the likes of Coventry, QPR and Rotherham, the ones going the other way. In League 2, if we can get to this level reputation-wise, we've still got the likes of Bolton, Notts County are up there again, Swindon, Tranmere, those sorts of teams. They're the ones that we'll be aiming to sign players from across the nation, not just for us as a club. And in the National League, I think the biggest surprise there in terms of name is Port Vale. Gillingham as well, who have dropped two divisions. They started with a good side as well. So interesting to see both of those down there. But that's where we are at the moment. If you did enjoy this episode and just that little glance into what we're trying to do here with the nation, please do put a thumbs up on the video. You got a little spoiler there as to our first qualifier in the Champions League. We're comfortable favourites and we'll play it off camera and hopefully be back for a big one in the second. If we make it a meter objectives. Even that would be one better than last year. If you want to stay up to date with the next five years, I promise you the rest of the episodes will be transfers, will be game commentaries, will be the exciting stuff. Please do subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on. There's daily content from two long-term stories, all the playlists in the eye above. And of course, there's two live streams a week. So please do pop in and say hello. You can catch up with the link to the podcast channel up there too. Plenty of football content over on that channel. But a massive thank you for watching, for supporting the first five years of this series. And I hope you enjoy the next five as much as I'm looking forward to them. I'll see you next time. And fingers crossed, lots of good transfer news. I'll see you there.